Well, um, a teacher who ta- teaches a second grade class was giving them a lesson on magnets. Okay, you remember those days in class when we could bring in magnets and stuff? And she was trying to tell them a little bit about the science of a magnet. And uh, so she was telling them all the things that magnets can do. So the next day, she decided that she'd give a pop quiz. And one of the questions on the quiz was, what am I? I have, I'm seven or six letters. I begin with an M and I pick things up. 70% of the kids said, your mother. So anyway, uh, okay, that was bad. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Well, let's, let's get serious. For a bad, I'm going to hear about that one afterwards. You told that in church? Okay. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I, I was praying about uh, where we would go today. And you know at St. Paul, we, we teach in series. And we try to look at series of, of things that we deal with, struggles and the challenges that we see in life. And, and how we as a faith community are supposed to actually deal with that. A couple weeks ago, I really felt like today needed to focus on what today is, Mother's Day. And uh, the reason I want to do that is, um, and we're also going to focus on fathers on Father's Day, but I, I really think it's because so many of our moms are what I call behind-the-scenes kind of people. Um, they're, they're so far behind the scenes, they don't like to take the forefront, but yet we have so much to be grateful for. Uh, for our moms and, like I said, the women who have been uh, impactful in our lives. And, and I hope today is a day that, uh, that we can honor them uh, on this Mother's Day. Uh, a great poem by William Ross Wallace. He wrote these uh, powerful words, and in the frame of his famous poem, he says this, the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. And if you think about that, there's so much truth to that. And, and, and so it's so important for us to make sure that um, as, as men and as women that we are becoming godly persons, especially with the influence that we have over our children. Well, the Apostle Paul, uh, in his uh, second letter to Timothy, uh, Paul was actually writing, that's his last letter that he wrote before he was executed. I told you a couple weeks ago, all the apostles except for one were executed for their faith. Uh, Paul was executed because of his faith. So he writes this second letter to Timothy, and it's a a, a sweet letter. It's it's poured out. It's a very pastoral letter. But it's one where he writes and he shares so much affirmation that he has for Timothy. Timothy was not his biological son, even though he refers to Timothy so often as my son. It was his spiritual son. And we see in this letter that uh, Paul writes that that his uh, affirmation and his love for Timothy was so powerful that he recognizes so many of the different places where Timothy um, uh, lifted Paul up and that Paul also lifted Timothy up. So let me share with you, uh, and it's in regards to Mother's Day, uh, that this passage that I want to kind of tie the two in. But here's what Paul writes in his second letter to Timothy, chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, according to the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus, To Timothy, my dear son, there's that endearing quality, that affirmation, um, not biological, but but I love you, You're, you're my dear son. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. Now listen to these words. I thank God whom I serve as my forefathers did, with a clear conscience as night and day, I constantly remember you in my prayers." Folks, think about what that would mean if, if you had, or maybe you do have someone, and I know that there's lots of prayers in this room that remembered you daily in their prayers. Again, just affirmation. Recalling your tears, I long to see you so that I might be filled with joy, and I've been reminded of your sincere faith, which was first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. So Paul talks about this, this faith, this foundation that, that uh, Timothy has. And he says the words, he says, filled with you. And, and I could just hear the tenderness as he's calling out uh, to his beloved. He's calling out in this tenderness and he says these words that, that, that Timothy, you've had such an impact on my life. And I pray for you daily in that. You know, when we start scrolling through the Bible and we start looking for some superheroes, and we did a series on that a couple of, probably last year, I think it was, where we looked at some superheroes of the Bible. But if we started asking, well, who are some of the names that we know in the scriptures? We'd rattle off in the Old Testament, like Abraham and Moses and Noah and Samson and uh, Obadiah and, you know, all those kind of guys. 
and the Italian prophet Malachi, and, 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 then we'd, and then we'd go over into the New Testament, and we'd say, well, we know about Paul, and we know about Jesus, and we'd probably name off the disciples. But where in our right minds would any of us ever remember to say, Eunice and Lois? We wouldn't. But Paul, Paul, like, he gets us right here and he says, you know, Eunice and Lois were such an impact in your life, Timothy, like so many of our moms today. And he wants to honor them. So, so I want to share with you a couple of godly traits or traits um, that I think are beholden uh, to women and moms as we look at this. And, and first is that a, a godly mom is a woman who's an example, who lives an example to be followed. So Paul says, Timothy, I recall your sincere faith. How did he get that? Eunice, his mother, Lois, his grandmother, had poured that into his life. It was genuine. And he says, before I saw that kind of faith in you, I saw it in your mama and in your grandmama. And I saw it through your lineage that's there. Tony Morita, who's a Christian writer, he, he said these words, one cannot overstate the importance of living out the Christian life before watching children. So, so think about that and listen to me very closely. Our children watch us. Our children observe everything that there is happening in our life. When I, when I do premarital counseling for couples, I say to them, whenever you have children, make sure that your children see the real you. Make sure that they see how you are to forgive. Not that we're supposed to have our disagreements in front of our children, but sometimes we need to let our children see that when we have those disagreements, that mom or dad forgives mom or dad and that there's restoration. Our children watch, and with their eyes, they, they see all of these things, and, and we understand that, that we have a responsibility in living a godly life, and that our children see everything that we do. The, the Greek word that, that Paul chooses to use in this text for sincere uh, tra- has, has actually two translations. The first one is hypocrite, so sincere, translates into the word hypocrite, but it also has a prefix that it translates into, without. So what he's saying is that your faith needs to be sincere. Our faith needs to be without hypocrisy, is what Paul is saying. And that that faith that we live in is one that should matter. And how does he, how does he think about that, and, and what was kind of the slate that he was using to paint that picture? If you think about the Greeks, whenever they would do their arts, they would be in theater, okay? Okay. And, and they didn't have the kind of stuff that we have today. They didn't have lights. They didn't have um, amplifiers and audio, audio sound and, and microphones and, and speakers and smoke and screens and all that kind of stuff. They basically acted on a stage. And what the Greek actors would have to do is they'd have to wear different masks so that it could portray to the audience the emotion or the feeling or the purpose of what they were trying to do at that moment. So they were constantly switching masks with things that they were doing in the play so that the audience could tie into exactly what they were doing. And in, and in the Greek, it's, it's, it's uh, translated into hypocrites. And, and from that, we get the word hypocrite or hypocrisy from. So literally, when the Greek actor was standing on stage and using those masks to, to, to act out the emotions that they were, it, they were called hypocrites. Because you never knew what their real emotion was because they were always wearing a mask on the outside so that they could get the approval of the audience who was watching them. And Paul says, "Uh, Timothy, I saw in your mother and I saw in your grandmother a genuine, real, authentic faith. I saw a Sunday kind of faith. And and what he's saying to us is that, that we need to be careful, we need to be guarded, that the faith that we live and the actions that we are and the life that we live on Sunday or Monday through Saturday is the same that we show each other on Sunday. And Paul says that we have to make sure Because if we're not, our children are the first that will see who we really are. Uh, Scripture says a couple of wonderful things about about being a mom. Um, It says that a mom has a heart in pursuit of Christ. So if if we're going to be a godly parent, if you're going to be a godly mom, your heart should pursue the love of Jesus Christ. And what does that look like? That, That means striving daily to abide 
into the presence of God. Striving daily to listen for what God is saying for you in your life. Striving daily to, to live out the kind of life that God created you to do so that you can actually be in mission not only in your home, but in your workplace, in your community, and, and ultimately in the world. Now, Eunice was quite unique. She was a single mother. And what we learn about that is that we're not really sure why Eunice was a single mother. She was married to a Greek at one time who was a non-believer, but he's out of the picture. So we don't know if he was killed in some kind of battle or died or if there was a divorce or something. But we knew that, that Eunice's life was tough as a single mom and that as she struggled every day, that it was, it was her obligation to make sure that her children knew about the love of God, that the moment that her children left the home, that they would have the foundation, that they would have the building blocks so that they could be the kind of people that God wanted them to be, that she could teach them that this is what society teaches. Society says run after money. Society pushes after you know, how we look. Society pushes after all those superficial things, but yet Eunice was making sure that she was living into a life in pursuit of God. And she was instilling that into, into her family. When a mother anticipates and, and prays and leads her children towards Christ, folks, she has every right to expect that God is going to meet her in that prayer. And I can assure you, you can bet on that. If you are praying that kind of prayer, you can bet assuredly that God will meet you into that prayer and that God's blessing will be upon you as you are raising your family and bringing them up. So, so we also see that, that we need to make family a priority. Family needs to be a priority in our lives. And especially uh, moms and dads, we need to make family a focus and a priority. We, we live in a day where, where families attack. We're attacked all the time and the family unit's being attacked. We're being pulled and, and, and stretched and we're being uh, pushed into various directions and moms are getting pressures about what they should or shouldn't do or be in all those things. And I love the fact that Proverbs 31 is a part of our scripture. If you've never read Proverbs 31 and you're a mom, I want to encourage you to read that um, in the latter verses of Proverbs 31. And it talks about how a woman is of noble character, how she, how she works outside of the home, how she earns a living for her family, how she loves her, her, her spouse, how she treats her kids. She, she, does, she makes their clothes. She does all these beautiful things. And her husband is very well respected because of who his wife is. And it's such a beautiful thing for us to see. So moms, if you're feeling the pressures about, you know, can you work outside of the home and be a Christian mom? I think Proverbs 30, 31 says you can. And, and, and as you strive to live into that kind of role in that life, know and be assured that, that God is blessing. God is blessing you in those moments. But there's also something else here that we see in a quality of a, of a woman uh, of godly character. And that is that you should pour into the life of other women. Don't just satisfy your own life, but pour into the life of other women you know, we've all been called to make disciples, and we see that in Matthew 28, where Jesus gives that call, go and make disciples of all nations. And we need to also pour into the lives of the younger women who are in our communities as well. Listen to what Paul writes in his letter to Titus. Likewise, teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live, not to be slanderers or addicted to much wine, but to teach what is good then... They can train the younger women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled and pure, to be busy at home, and to be kind. So, so he, says, he says here, teach the older women. Now, someone came up to me at the last service and said, why are you talking, is this old women supposed to do that? No, he didn't say old women, he says older. And what he's talking about is older in a sense that you have life experiences, He's not talking about a certain age. He's saying if you are an older person in a sense that you have had life's experiences, then you have wisdom. You have things that you have experienced in your life. And because you have experienced it in your life, pour that out into the younger women who have yet to experience that. And let them see warts and all, your successes and your failures, and to be able to get to the point in their life where they can see the grace of God that will pick them up when they fall and encourage them in that particular way. A godly mom lays the foundation of Scripture to be used 
by the Holy Spirit. You know, were you taught a, a verse, were you taught a verse at home? Did your mom instill a verse with you? Did she, did she give you a particular verse that was a life verse that you were to have in your, in your life? Some moms did that. If you're a mom today, maybe, maybe that's something that you need to start thinking about is what's the life verse to give my child? Because one day, as we teach our children the scriptures, one day the Holy Spirit will use what we have taught them in a powerful way for them, in a powerful way for them, so that they can become a better person. And that's an important thing for us to look at when we see this. You know, here's, here's what he says here. He says that, um, you know, it's what you've learned. And in Greek, the word learn translates into disciple. So, so we are to disciple or disciple one each, each other from the earliest portions of childhood. And if we take a look at the word um, childhood, it has three different meanings. Childhood can originally mean, you know, from, from a, a, a toddler's point of view like uh, pediatric, it comes from a Greek derivative of that. It can also mean an older child, one that's of adolescence age. But the, the one that's in particular is the infancy side. So it covers all ages of what that is. And Paul is saying it doesn't matter how old your child is, but we should start from the earliest stages of infancy and start teaching them what the scripture is. And he says, Timothy, your mom and your grandma, before you were old enough to talk, walk, speak, or eat, uh, when you were an infant, they began to pour into you the Word of God. And that's the foundation, Timothy, upon which you were raised. You know, Patty probably could tell you that um, her mom, in, in a powerful way, did that for her. You know, Patty, when she was growing up, and even up until the time uh, her mom died this year, uh, whenever there was something going on in Patty's life, she would say, Mom, what should I do about that? And her mom's comment was always, pray about it, right? Pray about it. And so as, as you think about that, you know, her mom was taking her back to a Thessalonians passage where it says, be joyful always, pray continually, and give thanks in all circumstances for this is God's will for you in Jesus Christ. And so Patty, through her life, through the works of the Holy Spirit, could see how that particular scripture that her mother poured into her would make a difference later in life. A godly mom provides wisdom for life's tough choices. One of the hardest lessons that parents can learn is when it comes to raising our children that we need to be their parent first and not their friend first. Now I know that might shock some of you to hear me say those words, but we're called to be their parent first. You know, it says here in Proverbs 6, my son or daughter, keep your father's commands and do not forsake your mother's teaching, but bind them upon your heart forever. Fasten them around your neck, and when you walk, they will guide you. When you sleep, they will watch over you. When you awake, they will speak to you. For these commands are a lamp, this teaching is a light, and the corrections of discipline are the way of life. Here's a promise I'll make to you. If, if you will parent your children today, I promise you, tomorrow they'll be your friend. We have tough choices to make for our kids. We're competing against other families who have the cool parents, and we're not the cool parents. And there's challenges that are there. But hold on to your ability to be their parent out of love. And in those years where your children stray from you, when those relationships get strange, estranged, especially during middle school and high school and some of those kinds of things, if you will just hold true to that, one day they'll be your friend again if you remain their parent and you love them in the way God loves them. Our role as a godly mom is to pour into our children daily for that wisdom that comes. So here, here's a challenge for this morning. A couple of things I just want to kind of uh, throw out this morning that, that might be helpful. If, if you're here today and you're not yet a mom but you desire to be, let me give you a word to hold on to, a word that you can take away. So if, if you are not a mom and you want to be a mom, uh, things haven't worked out for you to be a mom yet, take this word. The word is resolve. Be resolved to trust in God. Whatever happens, happens. And if for some reason, if, you're, if your plight to have a, a biological child doesn't happen, think of other ways in which you can fulfill that dream. There's many ways to do that. But, but resolve, 
So be resolved to stand in there. If, if you're currently in the season of, pra- of parenting, so like if you have kids at home right now, here's a couple words from you. Remain and keep on keeping on. Hang in there. It'll be okay. Be consistent. Hang in there. Keep on keeping on. Live out these principles that we've talked about today. And your children will have the foundation that they're needed. For those of you that are, that are here this morning and, and uh, you've, you've had children and you're in a different season of life, and now maybe you have grandchildren or great-grandchildren, then, then the word that I have for you or the phrase I have for you today is to reach back. Reach back into the life of someone who's younger, pour into their life, and give them the kind of wisdom that you have learned through your years. Let me just share with you this uh, poem written by Irma Bombeck, or it's an essay, When God Created Women. Here's what uh, Irma Bombeck said. By the time Lord made mothers, he was into his sixth day of working overtime. An angel appeared to him. Why are you spending so much time on this? And the Lord answered saying, have you seen the spec sheet on her? She has to be completely washable, but not plastic. Have 200 movable parts, none replaceable. Run on black coffee and leftovers and have a lap that can hold three children at one time. Have a kiss that can cure anything from a scraped knee to a broken heart and have six pairs of hands. The angel was astounded at the spec sheet for this one. Six pairs of hands, no way, said the angel. And the Lord replied, oh, it's not the hands that are the problem. It's the three pairs of eyes that mothers have to have. One pair of eyes to see through those closed doors when she asks, what are you kids doing in there? Another pair of eyes in the back of her head to see what she shouldn't, but she has to know. And of course, that pair that's in the front that can look at a child when she goose up and say, I understand and I love you without uttering such as a word. The angel tried to to stop the Lord. This is too much work for the day. Wait until tomorrow to finish. But I can't, the Lord said. I'm so close to finishing a creation that is so close to my heart. She already heals herself when she's sick and can feed a family of six on a pound of hamburger and can get a a nine-year-old to actually stand in the shower. And the angel moved closer and he touched the woman. But you've made her so soft, Lord. She is soft, the Lord said. But I've also made her tough. You have no idea what she can endure or accomplish. Will she be able to think, asked the angel. The Lord replied, not only will she be able to think, she'll be able to reason and negotiate. And the angel then noticed something and and reached out and, and touched the woman's cheek. Oops, it looks like you have a leak in this model. I told you that you were putting too much into this one. That's not a leak, the Lord objected. That's a tear. What's a tear for? The angel asked. The Lord said, the tear is her way of expressing her joy and her sorrow, her disappointment, her pain, her loneliness, her grief, and her pride. And the angel was impressed. You're a genius, Lord. This woman, she's amazing. She's amazing. 